Ben Curtis is joining us uh, from Dallas, Texas, where he has private practice and graduated from the Baylor College of Dentistry. With that being said, it's my pleasure to warmly welcome Dr. Ben Curtis. Well, thank you all for coming and joining us again this afternoon here. And it is a great pleasure of mine to be able to um, conduct this panel here. I have a very close, near and dear friend of mine, Dr. Rena Kuba, that has joined us here. Um, Dr. Kuba and I work together in Dallas, Texas area. Um, she private practice there and I'm her associate. We have um, a blast the majority of days to work together and she is the reason that I gotten into laser dentistry and pediatrics and um, it's really a treat for us to get to come and talk to y'all today. There's going to be lots of playful banter back and forth I'm sure as we always like to have a good time. So um, once again who am I for those that um, didn't join us Earlier in the week, I'm Ben Curtis. I am a board certified pediatric dentist in private practice in Dallas. I um, work for BioLace, doing consulting work for them. I also do training and teach courses for them as well, be it hands on or lectures. This is this. And I do normally receive an armata armatarium for, my, for them. Um, I will turn it over to Dr. Kuba here to give you a little bit about her. Hi everybody, I'm so excited to be here and to uh, join in today and give you my two cents. Um, I, like Dr. Curtis mentioned, practice in the Dallas area and uh, we've been BioLase users for five or six years now and uh, super excited to incorporate it into our pedo practice and um, just have enjoyed having another tool in the tool belt and that's how I view it. I will continue to probably go back to that phrase as we continue our discussion here today. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'm happy to be here. Thank you for having me. And like I mentioned, Dr. Rena Kuba and I, we work together at Children's Dental Center of Irving. And so any follow-up information from the both of us, you can reach us there via that website and we're more than happy to correspond with you and help. Um, so we're going to kind of go over a couple of cases here just to kind of touch back. On Wednesday, we covered mostly primary teeth and implementing restoration, so hard tissue with the laser. And today I wanted to touch on another realm of pediatric dentistry where it relates more to adult teeth or young prime or young permanent teeth, excuse me, and doing restorations on those and how we can utilize the laser to help with that. So we'll go through two cases of those and then we'll open up into the Q&A. We've got many questions that y'all had submitted from the discussion on Wednesday that we'll walk through. And then at the end, we'll open it up for a live Q&A. We'll be happy to answer any more of your questions for the time that we have. Um, our goal for y'all is just to keep an open mind. And remember that when we're looking at an all tissue laser, it does so much more than the soft tissues. As we talked about the other day, a lot of times phrenectomies hold true in our minds for the majority of the procedures when we think about pediatrics, but there's a whole nother realm in that tool belt, as Dr. Kuba likes to call it, where we can find a way to make this treatment very efficient and very nice for our patients and ourselves. And so that's my goal for you today is to keep that in mind for permanent teeth in children as well. The laser we're gonna be discussing today, once again, is the BioLace Water Lace I Plus laser. That's what Dr. Koopa and I utilize in our practice every day in Dallas. We chose this laser for several reasons. It's kind of the user-friendly way of doing it with that touch screen here. We'll kind of walk you through once again how that goes and that we can do both the soft tissue and the hard tissue with that and how user-friendly that is for our staff and us as the provider. So let's take a look here at tooth number seven, ML composite. So being a pediatric dentist, I do not wake up in the morning just excited about doing permanent teeth, particularly anterior ones. Um, actually, that's one of the reasons I went into pediatrics is to get away from these, but um, sometimes we just can't avoid them. Those kids with the braces and they just don't take care of them. And now uh, we got white spots, we've got interproximal caries. Uh, what are we gonna do? And so we find ourselves once again, having to do these that I personally myself don't find enjoyable. So I wanna take you through this case that I found very eye-opening by utilizing the laser, okay? So this is our kiddo here. He had um, 
full permanent dentition, finished orthodontics, your classic teenage male. He had interproximal caries on the mesial of both of his laterals, okay? And um, this technique is just putting in a little ortho separator to give yourself just a little bit of space there. I find that that can be very, very helpful to give yourself just a little bit more room to polish and to prep with. So I've started to integrate that into my um, anterior composite work there. And this is just kind of showing you how nice and clean the area was. So it's not like we're dealing with a very large cavitation or anything like that, but definitely we know these young Young permanent teeth can be quite sensitive to things and so um, I always get a little anxious on working on those and normally the injections into these areas are quite painful so we know that the patients themselves a lot of times struggle with that portion and then the numbness around the nose and the lip can be quite unpleasant for some patients as well so for many reasons I don't enjoy these in the traditional fashion um, I utilize the gold hand piece for this procedure here and we've got different tips we can choose from when we're utilizing that gold hand piece, which is very similar to the high speed in its feel. And most of the time for my composites, I'm going to be using an MZ5 or an MZ6. The reason is, is because it's going to be a more slender dynamic of that light energy as opposed to, let's say, the 8 or the 10, which is a little broad and a little more shallow. So I prefer this realm for my crown preps and this realm for my composites. And then I go into the home screen, and this is just, once again, the touch screen here. We'll go into the restorative button. We can click through which options we want. And then we've got our comfort, rapid, and bond. And then our different preset settings down here. The method, once again, that I really like to use is starting off on the bond prep, moving up to comfort prep, and moving up to rapid prep. That's mainly from the low energy to the high energy. And we'll walk through that a little bit more in the Q&A section. But really, that kind of gets the patient used to the process and trials it, particularly in this case, by not numbing up this permanent tooth up there in the front, just putting on a little topical, it really helps me gauge how sensitive that tooth may become to the procedure here or how great the patient themselves might do at accepting that. So I really like starting off with bond prep for that reason. And I really love this slide because it reminds us that this is end cutting. The light energy comes at the end, unlike the burr, which cuts on the side as we move that 330 around in the traditional fashion. This, once again, we're not touching to the tooth. We're hovering one to two millimeters away, and that light energy is attracted to the destructive area within the caries, and thus we can remove the caries in a very controlled, conservative fashion. So let's take into consideration this tooth number seven, all right? I wanted to kind of look up here and see how we're getting a little bit of bleeding over here. That's because this is a split mouth study here. I did number 10 with regular injection. So I tried that first, just being very traditional in this kid. It was, you know, your normal traditional situation and he was really good. And so this was one where I wanted to see how great it would work on the other side that wasn't numb yet, knowing that he did well on the other side with the traditional numbing. So we proceeded on this side without numbing the patient and really nice overall gingival tissue, so not a big deal. We've created just a little space with that orthodontic separator. And with that bond prep setting, we get just a little bit of etching right here in that area. So I'm just putting that energy right through there, up and down ever so slightly to be able to get him used to that. Then we will turn the laser up where we do the initial kind of removal of that with the comfort prep, which basically goes in and uncovers the area and helps us make basically like a little pilot slot into that area to uncover where the caries are. Mm -hmm. And he didn't feel anything. And I defocus and focus that energy to help make sure that we're keeping a little bit more of that laser analgesia and we're not just zapping him with the high energy right out of the bat, okay? Then we turn it up to rapid after we've done that. And each of these intervals, y'all, is only maybe a minute or so each. I'm not doing this for five minutes on each of these settings, okay? It's a very short amount of time, and that's where this does it very, very efficiently, all right? We're down here to the curious level, and we turn it on to that rapid prep. See how nice and conservative this is? We've almost got a perfect little box prep right here within two minutes of even initiating this procedure. He is not numb, okay? Just a little bit of that best topical ever. 
then I always like to go back and refine with a high speed hand piece and a burr, okay? And so I just refined that area out, broke just a little bit of contact there to have more of that traditional retention that I am one that's in favor of with my preparations. And so we've got a beautiful conservative restoration. This took five minutes from touching the tooth to getting to the point of restoration, okay, without numbness. What I love about that is that translates to less chair time by not having to numb him up and wait for that, not having to walk through the other steps that we normally are so used to. That's one of the things that I appreciate so much about this from the patient standpoint too. They just have to sit still less. Then we finish it off and it's a beautiful restoration. You'll notice we have a little bit of bleeding from the gums here. That's because I like to take those little interproximal filing strips to give it that nice smooth interproximal, which normally gets the gums bleeding just a little bit. But when we put that ortho separator in, it gives you just that little extra space so you can file this down really nicely to create a nice smooth margin all the way up and down. This took once again, from start to finish, maybe seven, less than 10 minutes for sure, maybe seven to eight minutes from start to finish on a procedure that I get up in the morning and was going to hate to do. This was an eye-opening experience. When we talked about that job satisfaction, both my sister and I are like, we can't believe that works so well. Those are the moments that I live for in private practice when the parent is in the corner begging to have this done for them next time and we have to tell them, we only see children here, man. We don't see adults, okay? And those are great feelings to have because you know that you've won that rapport of that parent. You know you've taken the best care you can of the patient and you know you've won that staff's trust inevitably for sure with how great a care you've taken for them. And so I have without a doubt that that's gonna be an excellent long-term restoration for them and we did it very, very conservatively. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Kuba and she's going to review with you a case here. So um, we're going to move on, like Dr. Curtis said, to another case. And here we're going to be talking about tooth number 30 um, that had uh, occlusal and buccal decay on a partially erupted tooth number 30. So again, for I think most of us, uh, definitely for a pediatric dentist, this is one that frustrates us because typically decay this size on the occlusal surface and a buccal pit, once that tooth has erupted, that's kind of our easy bread and butter, right? Like get the kid in the chair, boom, boom, we're done. But when it's partially erupted like this and you can't even access the lesion, especially on the buccal, uh, you still have a little operculum left on the occlusal, uh, definitely presents for a more challenging restoration and experience for the patient. Um, Traditionally, what would I do with this? Well, option number one is maybe pack some cord on the buckle. Um, again, like Dr. Curtis was saying, on a day where I'm packing cord, something's gone wrong. I'm a pediatric dentist, I want to pack cord. So, um, but that's an, that's an option here. We could pack cord, probably opt to leave the operculum alone, use a instrument to kind of um, push it back, retract it and um, hope for the best? Or could I uh, use some retraction paste and plan a glass ionomer in there to bias time until the tooth comes in? So those are kind of our uh, typical options. Or do we just wait until the tooth erupts further? Mom, here's some Prevident and you help with brushing. So those are all things that we, we used to do. So none of which brought us true joy. And I think uh, probably Dr. Curtis and I both could say this is where we are ah, permanent tooth, get this out of here. You know, I don't want to deal with this. But now with our uh, laser, what I really liked about this case is I've got dual application. One, the size of that occlusal lesion, very straightforward to use the hard tissue setting. Um, like Dr. Curtis said, with a MZ5, 6, maybe even an 8, and uh, do the occlusal prep um, using the gold hand piece, which can also Oh, thank you. Perfect. Which can also then be used to remove some of that buccal tissue, perhaps even a little bit of the operculum, um, very quickly, very easily, very conservatively, um, and <laughs> without sounding cliche, literally with the touch of a button. So it's, from an efficiency standpoint, super easy. So, um, you know, again, this case we did with just topical and um, that's very rewarding for both us and the patient, also for the chair time involved. So here, you know, you could opt to do either one first. We opted to do the gingivectomy first. And um, again, with the touch screen, selected the rapid cut setting. 
um, again, after placing a little bit of topical and uh, very um, quickly, efficiently, kind of, again, with when you um, are cutting with a scalpel, you want one quick, efficient swoop, um, not a bunch of little cuts. And so we pick our rapid cut setting and um, just a basic, a little trough, just removing just a little bit of that buckle tissue to expose the carious buckle pit so that we have access. Um, and again, that takes maybe 30 seconds. It's very quick and rarely, if any, bleeding at all. If you get any, you can always just push the next button down from rapid prep and you can go to a um, laser bandage setting. Again, total time to access that 30 seconds, a minute perhaps, but typically 30 seconds at most. And there you go, you've got your buckle um, uh, pit accessed and you can see here almost no bleeding, uh, very conservative, very minor removal of tissue, um, much kinder obviously than using a scalpel. And um, I think you can see a little bit there on the upper left corner there, mild um, operculectomy just to ensure that we could get great isolation on the tooth. Um, so that's what I really love is the, uh, from the assistance standpoint, the efficiency and um, not having to bring everything from our toolbox into the room, scalpel and this and that, or again, the other methods that I talked about that have been our traditional options, none of which I found particularly ideal. And here I, I can place an ideal restoration and continue to be conservative. Um, so it's a win-win for everybody. And all without um, numbing, again, also, you know? uh, correct, absolutely. Not numbing, um, very little um, chair time. So from all angles, there's really no downside to this procedure. And it's actually one of those very rewarding, oh gosh, look what we did so quickly, so effectively. Um, and uh, it just, it, it, to, to be able to do this, was, you know, five, six years ago, I didn't have those tools. So could this be done with other methods? Absolutely, absolutely. Any of those other things that I had talked about before, but now we can offer this. It's, it's, uh, it's a game changer. And it helps simplify everything too. You know, we just don't have to have as much out. There's not as much troubleshooting through it. We know that our equipment's gonna work very efficient and gonna get it done well. Um, so I really love both of those cases because they're really great combos of things that for Dr. Kuba and I, we really just don't like to do those. Those are cases, like I said, we just don't wake up in the morning and love to do it. But now with the laser and how we can utilize that, particularly the, the soft tissue and hard tissue component with that last case, we're able to easily translate using the same tip on there, just change the settings. You don't even have to put your hand piece down. You just change the setting and whip it out. And so it's so much smoother and efficient in chair time. And so I think those are two huge cases that really were eye-opening to me in my practice. Um, we're gonna move on to the- fun. Dare we say fun, German yeah. teeth and fun is not typically in our yeah. uh, vocabulary, but- we love to come back and show each other these cases. Like, oh my gosh, you won't believe what we just did. I, I love that. And so it, it's really fun from a, from a colleague except standpoint too. You pat each other on the back, you know? Uh, so for the Q&A, we'll move on. And these questions came from, um, from all of y'all last time. And please ask questions today. We'll be happy to answer as many as we can in the time that we're allotted. Um, so let's start off with laser settings. So we got several questions about what laser settings do you use when you utilize kind of your prepping and everything. I get this question all the time. And it really depends on what laser you are using. So if you're going to use the BioLace laser, or if you're going to use uh, a Celea, a CO2 laser, or if you're doing just soft tissue with a light scalpel, each different laser company or laser that you might be getting from the company is going to work differently. A diode, an erbium, a CO2. So understanding what the active medium is that that laser is and also the wavelength that it functions within is really important to being able to understand how to best operate that. All right. That's for another day's discussion, but I want to plant that seed for you there. That is one of the reasons I love this laser, the Water Lace I Plus laser, is because that touch screen is so easy to use. We don't have to manipulate the joules, the watt, the pulses, the continuous wave. All of that is already factory preset for you. You can go in and tweak it if you want, 
But nor I find that I hardly ever tweak anything. I choose the appropriate tip I want and I go into the setting I want and it's easy, all right? It's very familiar to us when we're using a high speed or a slow speed, it's kind of comparable to changing out different burrs or different settings. Very easy to change that out. And so I really use the preset factory settings. So I try to keep it simple. As I was saying the other day, we're not gonna make this complicated. We're gonna keep it simple. That's the best way for me to practice in my practice too. So let's take a look at these settings. We've kind of walked through these a little bit, but these are the, the touch screen settings. So if I'm gonna do a class one, here are the settings down here. So if I was going to use the gold handpiece, which is the one we showed the pictures of a little bit ago, and this is an MZ8, the factory has set all of these for you. We've got the watts, the hertz, the air, and the water is preset. If that's going to be on the comfort prep for bond prep, these are our presettings here. And for the rapid prep, we've got our presettings over here. And so it's already in there. And once again, if I wanted to adjust those, I can, but I rarely find that I ever am adjusting those for anything, okay? Let's take a look at the class two settings. And I would use a class two setting for both my composites and a class two composite. So I use those interchangeably for that. So there's not necessarily a crown setting within the I+, but I don't really need one. I just utilize the class two as I was kind of talking to you about the other day and how I do the prep. But here are my settings that you can see through here depending once again on what the preset is. If we want to go to the faster, more rapid, it's going to change our watts and our hertz as comparable to the comfort prep, which is a little bit less tooth removal. Once again, it's easy. One click of a button. I don't have to mess with the settings or remember what those settings were or adjust it. They're already there for me. So I really like that. So those are always good questions about the settings there. Okay. Um, the laser sound here, I'll take this one too, Dr. Kuba. Um, do you find that there's less sound admitted with the water lace than the traditional high speed handpiece? This came from Sabrina. Sabrina, that is excellent. We've got um, a slide here. I'm going to show a video that also will help answer one of our other friends' questions here about the popping action of the laser. And I find that they're normally similar in fashion. For the I+, plus, it's not as loud as you would think it's going to be. In the video that I'm gonna show, I mean, it may come across as a little louder just with how the video camera was picking up the sound there, but it is more of just a buzz and a light popping noise. Some lasers have louder sounds than others, but I find that normally the I+, plus is a little lower in sound, and the patient isn't more disturbed by the laser sound versus the high-speed handpiece. Once again, we are jaded by the high-speed handpiece because that's our traditional tool that we're used to using. So it's just part of that toolbox that we have to use to get it done. And so now that we can eliminate part of that, we're able to introduce something that makes a noise as well, but with less vibration. And so I don't find that the water lace necessarily be less sound, it's just a different sound. I wouldn't say that it is a more of a sound, once again, it's just a different, similar sound. So let's take a look here. I may add to that. Um, I think what Dr. Curtis had mentioned before, how he starts with the bond prep. And so that is a softer sound. And so I think that's a great way to kind of warm your patient up and say, you know, we, we all have our different tell, show, do vocabulary of how we like to introduce that sound. Um, one thing that I tell all, all my patients, especially my, my young ones, what I love about this, my little water pen, it doesn't even touch your tooth. So you're going to hear it. It's going to rain on your tooth and it doesn't even touch you. Can you hear it? And when you start with that bond prep he had mentioned, um, and of course he's starting with that to be kinder to the tooth and warm up the tooth, but you're also warming up the patient with that softer sound. And then as you're upgrading to your um, more definitive settings, you're more... Um, what am I trying to say here? Your more restorative setting, not the bond prep setting. Um, that gets louder, but you just tell your patient, okay, now I'm gonna make my raindrops even harder, make, make it rain louder, um, and that's gonna finish cleaning this out. Oh, did you even know I was doing anything? You didn't even feel that, do you? Yep, I'm still not gonna touch your tooth. It's louder, but I'm not touching you still. And so um, I think that's part of it too. It definitely, it's a different sound, but that combo of what Dr. Curtis was talking about earlier of starting softer also wins you in this area as well. And that's why I like to call it the tell, show, do method, because in adult dentistry, they're probably going to talk to you about how to do it differently, starting off on different settings. 
I found with pediatrics and children, starting it off in that fashion is way more helpful for patient acceptance because a pediatric patient, as we all know, is much different than an adult patient is. And so when we're starting off on low and working high through that tell, show, do method of utilizing this, you're going to get a lot more patient acceptance and have a lot more higher no hurting and no shot situations there. So let's take a look at this video here. A lot of times I get questions about what does it sound like? What does the laser sound like? So here we've got it under the class two setting on the bond prep. And let's go ahead and activate the laser here. So it's powering up and charging. And we'll take our gold hand tube. So that's literally how I start the process. A Just a few clicks. So you hear just a little buzzing. It's actually a little louder in this video than it is in person. It's a little buzz noise, and that's that. I'm going to rewind it just a little bit so you can hear it again. Yeah. So just a little buzz noise, and that's that aiming beam that we're seeing there. Yeah, so literally it's just a tiny little buzz. And like I said, it's a little louder in this video, honestly, than it is in person. So that bond is just a little zzz buzz, kind of like a little insect flapping its wings. So I like to call it my butterfly as it's kissing your teeth, okay? So let's turn up the settings here and we'll listen to what it, class two settings with comfort prep and rapid prep. Let's turn it up to the comfort And it's gonna be a little louder that now. my camera's picking and up we'll the sound more. Here and we'll see what it sounds like. And then we'll come and we'll turn it up to rapid. So once again, class two with rapid. Just a little quicker of the same noise, just moving faster. And let's go back to comfort. Lower intervals in between. And then rapid. Faster in between. So really, it's not that loud, but just a little bit of a popping noise. So as you compare it to the zzz noise of the wee of your high-speed handpiece, the high-speed handpiece is actually octaves higher than this is going to be, and it's a little bit more ear-piercing, So, but we're used to that, okay? Where this, it's going to be a little bit more of a popping noise as it opposed to a really loud noise. And it's just a different sound and prepping the patient for that and understanding that we need to talk to them about that is really the most important part of that that I've found. And so yeah, I'm happy to be able to share with you kind of what those noises sound like there as well. So um, another question that um, came in last from Wednesday was regarding the smear layer. And this comes from Dr. Jillian and her comment. You to be a about fellow co resident of mine when I was in school. So, hi, Jillian. It's good to see you. <laughs> um, you talked about the smear layer being removed, but what happens to the collagen during preparation and how does that affect the composite dentin bonds? Um, so, a great question. And I think you're going to hear us saying this too. Again, a lot more research is needed. Um, so I think, um, you know, again, if, if it's something that from what we found, or, or I personally, I like to do my bond prep, um, or my smear layer removal prep, excuse me. And then I, I go ahead and prefer to etch um, to touch the areas that perhaps the laser beam did not access. So it's I'm kind of covering myself and I wouldn't etch for as long. Um, probably five seconds, 10 seconds again, and we're talking on a primary tooth. So um, I etch as well just to get areas of the box or areas of the wall that perhaps the laser aim, the beam didn't touch. Um, but to say that there's an actual um, molecular level, you know, um, effect, void or effect, et cetera, um, there's really not enough data out there that's consistent on again primary versus permanent what settings did you use etc so i think it's it's possible uh, certainly but um again we as clinicians we kind of see what results we're getting and we fine tune from there and um from what i've seen we don't have issues again i'm doing a lot more primary i, I tend to not like permanent class twos 
um, being in Dallas, I can refer those out all day long because they don't bring me much joy. Of course, perhaps I should try the laser, but we do have younger patients in our practice. Nonetheless, for primary teeth, um, that technique seems to work for me. I don't have composites falling out. I don't have sensitivity. So um, that's what I have continued to do. Um, certainly I'll more in on that too there, but you know, I'm an etcher. I'll be honest, you know, like I know the concept is out there and I, I love this slide because it kind of shows you on that, you know, close up kind of know, magnified level of what the tooth looks like with the smear with a rotary and what it looks like with the laser obviously they're totally different there. There's nothing here occluding anything, but I really like to have, to be a little bit more traditional in that fashion. But I have friends of mine that are more in the holistic or homeopathic practices, like that's the niche of their practice and they have great successes with it. And so obviously, as Dr. Kuh was saying, they wouldn't be doing it if they were seeing failures. So out of that in the future, we're really hoping that more data will be generated from those offices that we can thus use to have the research that we need to feel more comfortable with that too. But a, a really good concept out there that some people find. Yeah. Um, I, we got a great question here. What types of wedge do you use? This comes from Dr. Cherish. Hi, Dr. Cherish. Thanks for joining us. Um, this is a great picture here of one of my composite preparations, okay? I use just your traditional T-band, okay? That's what Dr. Kuba and I use in our office. We find that it works really well for primary teeth, maybe a little old school in fashion, but hey, keeping it simple sometimes is the easiest thing of all. We get really good results with it. Um, and we just use a traditional little plastic wedge through there. And so there's many different varieties of those on the market. I don't really like the wooden wedges. I like for there to be a little flexibility. Um, and particularly with kids, I don't want to have to go retrieve part of a wood wedge if it got stuck in the gums. And so I just like to stay away from the wood wedges. There's other different types of matrix systems out there that I like a little better for adult teeth. Um, and so there's different ones. The Garrison has a great one. And for our general dentist, they're probably looking at this thinking that it might seem a little archaic. But in pediatrics, we're working on a much smaller level there. And this is kind of the traditional way that many of us were trained in pediatrics to do this. And that is really still how both Dr. Kuba and I both utilize this in office. So great question there. And once again, I'll go back to say, we didn't numb this up. I just put this wedge through and I'm telling that patient, hey, we're going to give your tooth a really big hug. All right. We just love you pieces. We're going to give you a big hug. You ready for your tooth hug? Here it comes. One, two, three. Ooh, let's hug it out. And I push that wedge right through. Now, some of them are going to get a little squirmy with that and you have to be comfortable with that. If you're not comfortable with your kid moving around or maybe wincing just a little bit for a second and winning them back over, maybe you might want to consider putting on a little bit more topical on that area, which we've already done here. Um, or injecting into the papilla. I have some practitioners of mine that I've helped train that really just like to give just a dab of, of local right in the papilla area to help that be a little bit more comfortable for them. Um, totally cool, however you wanna handle that. Remember, once again, I don't call it a failure if I have to give an injection. I call it a success that we've got a good procedure done, okay? So good question there, Dr. Cherish, about kind of the systems we can use to get proper um, care for that. Um, in addition, if I may add, when you were talking about our archaic T-band, um, keeping in mind again, funky shaped primary teeth and they work really well for that to be able to mold and adjust it to our uh, quite often odd contacts that we're trying to restore. So um, keeping it very simple is great there. I know Dr. Curtis mentioned the Garrison. We, we love the Garrison wedges actually. Um, De Novo makes some prefabricated bands that work quite nicely too. So um, there's several several options out there, and, and we choose to keep it simple. Um, so our next question, uh, we had a couple on the um, composite restorations, and so one question from Dr. Wu came uh, was, "Can you use the laser for polishing or just for preparation?" And then Dr. Patricia, um, also kind of in the same vein, how do you polish burr or laser? So um, keeping in mind, we, we use our, at least I, and I, I believe Dr. Curtis as well, use the handpiece, the traditional handpiece to polish for several reasons. One, um, the laser is, you know, again, it's great for a lot of things, but it's not as precise. Um, also that it's attracted to the hydroxy appetite in the tooth, not to the composite itself. Um, so really, you'd kind of end up getting a melting kind of of the composite, not any finishing um, 
polishing there. So taking the burn do after you just put your beautiful composite. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. So taking, you know, on, on a tooth like this one in this example, taking a nice football burr and just gently ru rubbing it across. Um, at that point, the patient knows they're done. Um, and finishing it off with a handpiece is not a problem. And also keeping in mind the handpiece, you know, again, the laser, you're not going to do this composite, this particular, especially probably any, but especially this particular one, you're not going to do this without the aid of the handpiece as well. So your handpiece is already out and ready um, because you are using the laser to get your laser, laser analgesia, soften the enamel, get all those initial um, stages done. Then you take your handpiece, your 330 or whatever you're comfortable with, finish refining the preparation, um, go in with a slow speed if you want to. So you'll probably still have that there. So uh, I think that's one question we get quite often is, oh, so my laser, I'm not going to need my handpiece anymore. Absolutely not. You absolutely will need your handpiece, but it's just um, using each tool in different ways and having all three ready, boom, 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 boom. It makes it um, very efficient. So that was the long answer to you use your uh, traditional handpiece to laser just like you would, uh, excuse me, to polish just like you would if you weren't using your laser. And I'll kind of piggyback off of that. We, Do Dr. Coop and I both are very more traditional in our prepping fashions. And I, I know some practitioners out there just like the, the conservative caries removal and then filling of that we like to provide more of those retention features. We just find that it works better in our hands, in our practice. So some practitioners out there actually do try to utilize less of the handpiece and more of just the laser alone. And that's totally cool if that's how you want to finish off your preps and all. But I like for our mind to look a little bit more traditional as this is here. And once again, like she said, we already have the equipment out. So it's not like we're dragging it out for another thing. And we just gently polish over that. The patient's not feeling anything. It's just the finishing step. And a beautiful result. Crown preps here. Some great questions coming from, from a couple of our friends there. Robin here is asking, are you refining the margins with the laser or the handpiece? And to answer that shortly, both. Okay, so um, this is my rapid prep after I'm finishing. So I do go and do my interproximal reduction, the majority of it with the laser, just literally gently walking it down through this interproximal area through here. And then I use the laser to denature and dehydrate that outer layer. Then I take a diamond flame and zzz, ring around the rosy. And then you end up with this, that lay, that enamel layer that normally is a little hard that you're having to push on to get off of there, peels right off super easy with minimal touching. And now you've got a beautiful little round robin there. And so to answer our second question here, I do not solely use that for the crown prep. It would take a lot of time to remove off enough of that efficiently. So I find that it's not efficient for me just to utilize the laser. I wanna make it go quick and efficient. And so I need to do the combination of both my laser and my traditional high-speed handpiece to get the results quickly that I want. And I find I have no issues with that. I would much rather do it that fashion than spend more time with the laser doing it solely that way. You don't get an extra prize for just utilizing the laser, okay? The big prize comes with the kid having the best appointment. So put that in the back of your mind. Sometimes when we're trying to integrate this, we feel like we just have to use the laser for it. Oh no, let's make it easy on ourselves, okay? But also trying to reduce your walls with just the laser, the imprecision of that would, would be quite yeah quite inefficient as well. So um, basically when Dr. Curtis is mentioning going into those interproximal areas, you're really just trying to denature and soften that enamel so that your time with the handpiece is a lot less in those areas. Okay, sorry. So this, this one's to me, laser analgesia. So, oh goodness, isn't this the one, at least I remember when I was looking at lasers and it just seems magical and laser analgesia, and this is going to be great. And then you- wand, right? Right. And that's what, ah, you know, here it's arrived. Um, and then digging in and going, where's the button for the laser analgesia? Where, where is that part supposed to come? Why do I need topical? Um, so it was a little bit of a learning curve to understand that, um, there's, it's, it's not a button, it's not a procedure per se. So some of the questions we received, what's the reason that laser preparation usually does not require local anesthesia? Isn't the cavity close to the pulp, just like traditional prep? Do restorations experience the same amount of sensitivity afterwards for a short period of time, like a traditional hand piece? And also here was just a comment from Dr. Leticia that uh, 
she agreed that most of our little friends are just fine and do great without local anesthetics. So she's a, a laser user and, and concurred with Dr. Curtis's comments. Um, and I concur as well. Um, so to answer the, the first two questions on this slide here, um, the concept of laser analgesia is, again, for, for me, trying to keep things simple in this simple little brain of mine, there's a lot of biochemistry and physics and all of that that goes really behind that question. So there are courses, two and three day long courses to try to address that very question. Um, so obviously beyond the scope of, of this, but basically the concept is you are depolarizing um, sodium potassium pump channels, etc. So um, I, I hate to dodge the question, but certainly it's beyond the scope of both this hour that we have and also this non-physics brain of mine that really the thought of thinking about all of those very particular microscopic systems is beyond is beyond me at this point so um how does it do that one one thing here and i'm sorry if i'm messing up the screen here but one uh really good resource that i like um and I don't know if y'all can see this. I can't see myself on the screen, but uh, this is Dr. Chen. He is in Illinois, um, and uh, he offers courses. And and I, you know, was lucky enough to fly out there a couple of times and um, watch hands on. And that's what I loved about his course was that he had actual patients in his building. Anyway, he's written this book, and the first he's got a whole chapter on laser analgesia and the kind of mindset behind it and the different ways because it's not just one mindset on how it works. There's multiple different theories out there. So again, that's the very long answer to your question. How are we achieving laser analgesia? We are achieving laser analgesia. That's just where I leave it. And I have call magic through depolarization. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, but that, that's a very good question, but it's a, it's a very in-depth answer and somewhat controversial. Not everybody agrees on the theories of how exactly the tooth is being anesthetized. So um, uh, there, there's the non-answer to your question. Um, and then the other um, question about sensitivity, again, it's, it's like any other composite. If you're gonna desiccate the tooth, if you're not gonna bond properly, you're gonna have just the same kind of sensitivity as you would had you done it with a traditional handpiece. So the laser is not changing that. It's really your technique of how you are bonding and um, you know, uh, filling your, your uh, cavity. Um, and another question set of kind of subjects here for that is kind of related to potential trauma to the surrounding areas here. Um, we've got a first question here during the procedure. What happens if the laser touches like a metal band by accident or let's say a stainless steel crown next to it? What I love about it, if you, you'll think back to that picture that we had the diagram, it's cutting out of the tip of it, not the sides. So if you don't aim it at the metal band or if you don't aim it at the stainless steel crown, it's not gonna accidentally touch it. It'd be you accidentally angling it over there, okay? So we wanna make sure that we're being very precise with our movements of that and everything too. But if that happened, most likely nothing would happen, okay? That the, the energy would just scatter off of that. But if you sat there and continually aimed it at that, theoretically, some of that energy could zap back up into the machine and potentially cause some damage to the machine overall. So we wanna be very conscious of our angles of how we're using it, okay? Another question here about a barrier protection that we need to apply for neighboring teeth when doing a crown prep. Once again, I love how conservative and controlled I can be by angling that energy downward as opposed to with my um, diamond bar, it's cutting on the side. So I have to be very careful not to odontoplasty the tooth next to it when I'm doing a crown prep, but you're way less likely to remove tooth structure of the adjacent tooth with the laser unless you point the tip at it. Now this side, we've got perfect integrity here. Well, look at this, oopsies. I angled it a little wrong. And so I've got a little bit of denaturing to the adjacent too. So that's all on me. It's not the laser, okay? Um, I angled it just a little off to the side. Is this an issue? No, I'm gonna spray that with water. I'm gonna check it with my Explorer. It's gonna be nice and hard and it's gonna be perfectly fine, okay? Um, if for some reason you removed a little bit of that away, then you might need to polish it up a little bit or address it. Um, also another one, here along those same lines, when a kid moves during the op procedure, 
are you worried about soft tissue damage? And this is a great example of that too. So if you'll see here, as I was doing my interproximal reductions, I do have a little bit of quote unquote damage to that tissue. You would damage it with your high speed handpiece too, of course, just a little bit, nature of the beast there. This laser only has an effect on about five to 10 cell layers deep. So this is just going to schlep off of there and healthy um, tissue is underneath that. It's going to heal great. So if you accidentally get the gingiva here, not a big deal. You will not accidentally get other tissues around here unless you're within that one to two millimeter working length of the destructive zone. Remember how I talked about the other day when we we're doing infant phrenectomies? I love it for that because that baby is going to be moving a little bit and it's hard to completely control that head movement. And I know that I'm working distinctly with one to two millimeters of destructive zone. So if the baby moves and my hand moves over and the laser's still firing, nothing's gonna happen to that other tissue around that area unless I get really close to it, okay? And so it's a way more safer way of going about doing that too, in my opinion, because of that controlled working length. So those are both great questions there. And this is a great slide that kind of shows you a little bit of both of those and how they normally are a non-issue with the laser, okay? It's microns at a time. Yeah, a little bit. So we've got some good questions here about aerosols that we'll touch oh, on. So the, the topic of, of this month, right? Aerosols. So a couple of the questions and comments. Do you know the amount of aerosol with comparison of lasers to traditional hand pieces? Um, and then with water mole molecule ablation, are we worried about the aerosol actually increasing with the laser? Um, so again, to, here's my non-answer. It's we we really just don't know. There's not. I don't think anybody even thought about aerosols until these last couple of weeks, right? So I don't. There's really no um, literature that 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 describes this. Not to mention, it's so variable with the settings. Do you have what do you have for your water setting? And it's also similar with your handpiece. I think studies would be. Um, whatever is there, you really would have to look at it to say, well, is my high speed, what, what, what water level did you have with your high speed? What did you have your laser on? So um, this is really a much more complicated question. My, my thought would be, especially with this comment about with uh, the water molecule ablation, my, my thought is though the laser is very um, antimicrobial and a disinfecting procedure altogether. So if there was more aerosol, I, it's it's a cleaner aerosol. Um, I believe we have a slide here. Um, we could show that. So uh, before we get to the video slide, this is another slide that kind of just shows how much water is uh, you know typically used with a traditional handpiece versus the water lays. So we are using less water. Um, but again, it is it's about and here's the the video I was talking about. Um, so yeah, the one on the right is really showing, you know, you can see the water cloud of the aerosol where the left with the, with the laser, there's a lot less water, but yet there's still some splatter here. And so theoretically, as we were kind of talking about, it kind of makes sense that you're going to have a less potential aerosol, but it's really hard to know just yet. As Dr. Cooper was saying, we didn't really think a lot about this pre-COVID, but now we are. And so the thought process is there. We just need a little bit more research evidence to support it. And so it's a really great concept that I'm really looking forward to kind of what more of that answer is. And I think Dr. Harden makes some good points that we really just don't have the answers for just yet, but I'm really excited about it. And so I'm hopeful that we're going to find that the laser actually, we can get hard data that, like Dr. Coop was saying, it's, it's basically destroying a lot of those germs in the area, if you will, and making it a lot cleaner. And that's what Indo loves it for, is for its ability to basically decontaminate that infected pulp canal and give them better results. So is it decontaminating our aerosol as well? So we don't really have much data on that, and I can't wait to see it, okay? So that's an exciting topic right now, and um, honestly, it's in its infancy at the moment. We had some great commentary about SDF, and so I did the SDF case where it progressed and carries, and we had um, several questions here, one coming from Dr. Sin, about um, do you have any sparks that you see when you're utilizing that, when you're pre preparing it on uh, existing SDF? We do quite a bit of SDF in our practice, and we do more of the minimally invasive, not the really large ones. And so we're utilizing it more on those small incipients getting started, just like this case was. And when it gets kind of out of control, 
then we're moving on to the restorative, which was exactly what this is. I've never had an issue with any sparking or any issues with that not working really well or having any um, sort of laser damage to the fiber optics or anything coming from Dr. Ron, a concern there. We also had Dr. Patel that was saying in a, in a laser course that they took, the instructor mentioned that we might wanna be avoiding laser treatments in these teeth. I myself don't avoid it, okay? But if I was seeing some sparking, like Dr. Dixon's saying here, then I would be stopping immediately because that's not supposed to happen, okay? So I'd be troubleshooting and, and transitioning to something else there because Dr. Ron is spot on. We don't wanna damage our laser, okay? So if we're seeing an interaction with the two structure in a way that is not normal and not desirable, we do want to cease and desist immediately and change what we're doing. I have not experienced that myself at all. And I continue to do them with the SDF. So those were really great questions there great observations, and just there's going to be varying opinions. The other thing I mentioned, too, is that if you're doing an adult tooth that was a large, you know, kind of curious area that you were managing with the SDF, you may have more of that silver infiltrating within there, making a silver scaffolding that may result in more of a metallic structure of that, and thus making it more difficult to remove or sparks or potential issues there. But in our primary teeth, it tends to be a lot smaller. And so we live in the primary tooth realm here. And that's really where my expertise lies. And like I said, I haven't had any issues there, but great questions from that. We really appreciate y'all's insight on that there too. For our kind of little last thing, I love to touch on pulp treatments with this because it's like, is that voodoo to be using this for the pulp or not? So I really like that. And the FDA here in the US has approved this laser to be used for pulp treatments, okay? Like I said, we and PEDO have blinders on for pediatrics and we forget about other specialties out there like Indo that utilizes this quite often for their procedures very successfully. I love Dr. Letitia, you have given us another great insight here, girl. And so she's saying that with her pulp treatments with her Epic laser, which is a, a sister or a brother to the I+, she gets 90% success rate by utilizing that. And so thank you for sharing your successes there. I myself utilize it for my pulp treatments and I basically have bypassed the medicament. I won't use formocreosol or ferric sulfate in that case. I utilize the laser to basically do my hemorrhage control there and make sure I have a nice, good looking pulp chamber. Um, I do tend to be a number with that, okay? So I do like to give a little bit of an injection for that just to make sure my kid is super comfortable because I'm diving into that nerve and I just don't want to risk losing the kid's cooperation at that point. But there are many practitioners out there that have mastered the ability and the confidence to be able to do it without numbing. And so I know that that is an option for you too. And we'll take some slides here at the end. There's pre-settings in here. So within the home screen, you can go through the endodontic section and there's pre-settings for the pulp treatment, for the access of it, and then for the coagulation as well. So they've already preset those for you. Um, and so that's really helpful. This is a great slide of what your pulp chamber looks like afterwards, which is exactly what it would look like if you put ferric sulfate or formocreosol. It looks exactly the same. And conceptually as well, with it only having an effect on about five to cell layers, which is tiny, tiny, you're going to get way less inflammation. And we know that tends to be the issue that ferric sulfate fails and gets the, the resorption there is because of that inflammation process it sets off. With the form of creosol, we get basically we pickled and killed and preserved the pulp. So we asked it to die slowly. Here, we're actually asking the pulp to just behave, hang out, and be yourself, okay, and try to heal. And I personally believe that the pulp has a great power to heal itself. I think we've got many examples throughout dentistry of how that can happen. And so I'm really hopeful that this primary pulp full of stem cells does have the ability to be successfully managed this way too. That kind of concludes all of the questions we were able to kind of put together for you here from our Q&A the other day. Once again, if you wanted to reach out to us, here's our email at our office here. You can get Dr. Kuba and myself both there. It's a great email to find us both at. I love interacting over social media and also this is my doctor's Facebook page. So please feel free to reach out to me that way if you'd like as well. Um, and at this time, we'll turn it over for um, live Q&A as well.